G'day, Ron, and welcome to episode 130 of the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jonas Karpinen, a former trader for Bet365 and founder of Edge Alerta. Jonas, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alex. Good to be here, mate. Good to have you on, mate. Um, as I mentioned, you're a former worker for Bet365. I think we can kind of work in chronological order here, and that's kind of where you got started in the betting industry. Maybe just uh, explain to our our listeners and viewers, yeah, how you got to to working for Bet365, and and if you had any experience in betting before that. Yeah, sure. Um, happy to talk about that. So. My background, actually, out of high school, I pursued a pro golf career, uh, went over to the States on a, on a golf scholarship, and I gave that a crack. But uh, in my early 20s, realized that the, the future probability distribution of success doesn't look too great. So um, I decided to just go down a quant field. I studied quant finance at Sydney Uni, and I'd always been really analytical um, with whatever I was doing. So, uh, And I'd always, at the back of my mind, thought trading might be interesting. Uh, for me. So yeah, I did a quant finance degree there. I was lucky enough to get a, a part-time job at a hedge fund whilst at uni and, and that kind of started the whole the whole trading thing for me. Um, and from there, really, I worked at a, a few primarily in, in auctions market making, which is essentially like bookmaking, but in the uh, in the financial markets. And and that was that was a great run for about five years in that in that game, did some prop trading as well in and amongst that as well. And then the market's really quietened down, really low vol, super competitive. So a lot of the fat came out of the, the options game in the mid-2010s. And so I was kind of looking around at what what might be next. And I noticed Bet365 had just opened up an office in, in Sydney where I'm based. And I thought, you know what, um, I think there's probably something I can I can add there. Up until that point, I'd done a little bit of um, a betting, especially in golf and Formula One. They were kind of my niches. Um, given my background in golf and, and given my back, my background, having been born in Finland, I had a natural interest in Formula One. Um, so yeah, got in touch with them and then long story short, started there pretty soon after um, as an in-play trader and more like a generalist. And, and also uh, as, I, as things evolved, I got more into sport, uh, into golf, sorry. Uh, so I was essentially the head of in-play uh, golf for the Asian time zone there. And that was a good stint at Bet365, very interesting, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, then I was there for about five years and three years ago left to, to start Edge Alert up soon after. And um, yeah, that's really the, the two minute version. Yeah, we'll get into Edge Alert soon, but anything that shocked you or surprised you, pretty common question that you probably get mm. uh, working on mm. the other side of the fence. I mean, there's not, there's millions of people backing or backing to beat the bookies, but there's not many people working for as many people working for them. So anything mm. um, that people might be shocked by or f- just interesting? Um, I, probably as a general thing that surprised me was the amount of interest on, on totals betting. I really never had any idea that people would actually care so much for totals um, in, mm. in sport. I, but I guess it's just a different view that you can have on a game. Um, it could be a weather play uh, or just a vol play. Uh, that's probably a more general comment. What else? Probably in play betting is is obviously a lot of your viewers will know that it's it's bet three six five bread and butter. They do they have an, an amazing in play in play product. Um, so given that the the flows in in play sport were quite astounding, I, I didn't think that there'd be that much interest. And probably even further to that, even on the low level sport, uh, people the flows are quite big in in play. So. You might have a, a sort of a, a div two, div three game, whether it's soccer or tennis or basketball. No one really cares pre-game um, because it's mm. just random team A versus random team B. But once that's in play in the run, it actually gets quite exciting to bet on it, even if you're not watching it. You know, one team might be up 20 nil and you're betting on the race to 25 a dollar one or whatever it might be. So that's probably something that surprised me as well. I assume most of it's automated, but what's it like? I mean, I assume you're looking after multiple games live at the same time what's that what's that kind of like and how much are you mm. relying on automation yeah good question probably depends uh it varies from sport to sport um some some games some sports some markets are really easy to price uh like take tennis as an example it's quite easy to model you can you've got a lot of data you can you can you can just really run multicolor simulations on on the future outcomes uh it's very clean to model. 
Um, but then you go down the chain of into something like like a golf and like try and price golf up in the last round when you've got thirty players in the in in the in the mix and you've you don't have perfect information. You don't even know you might not even know what the, the true leaderboard is, let alone if someone's hit it out of bounds on the seventeenth. So that can get tricky. Uh, so it really comes down to the to the sport. So if, but if you're running um, if you're on that end of the spectrum of of modeling is easy and uh, the maths is quite pure, then you can obviously handle handle more games, more markets at once. And I'm sure you dealt with a range of customers, mate, both square or I guess punters and sharp mm. betters. Can you give any insight into I guess the the main difference or traits or bets that you you kind of mm. see uh, between those? You know, just distinct distinguish those kinds of betters. Yeah, sure. So I mean, ultimately, it comes down to how confident you are in the price. Um, number one, whether you're you're betting into a sharp or a, or laying a sharp or laying a square. Um, so ultimately, it comes down to how confident you are in the price. Um, there's a, I think one mistake um, or, or one one thing that people miss with the whole square versus sharp thing is it's not always black and white. It's you know, the way I'd look at it coming from the financial markets is would you, if you're considering someone at sharp, would you, as an investment manager, back that participant to bet for you? Because essentially, if you're framing them as a sharp and then you're going to move the prices whenever they bet, you're respecting that much that you'd back, you'd, you'd actually invest in them. Uh, so that's kind of the 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 one way to look at it. Um, and again, it's not binary, you know, yes or no, and and things evolve as well. And um, so, I'll give you an, a financial markets example as well. Like when I worked in options market making, there are parts of the volatility surface that are really liquid. And you could consider them kind of like the EPL markets, which are, there's a lot of flow. It's kind of easy to know where the market is. Um, whereas, you know, more niche markets are, are harder to price. In the financial markets, if, you, if you've got someone like Goldman Sachs um, buying down 30% puts in, in an index that, uh, you know, six, 12 months out, and they're, they're bidding that, they're buying there in size, and it's well and truly through your, through where you'd have that, part of the volatility surface, you sort of look at that and go, are they, how do you profile, how do you profile them? What's their track record, uh, given your, your back book, if you like, um, of observing them, whereas if it's a REIT, and obviously if you respect their flows, you're going to move your, move your curves there, move your price, which is obviously what we do in betting. Um, whereas if they're a retail broker who, uh, who just, you know, you got some high net worths who are just throwing darts around all day long and they've, they've built up that track record, um, then you might not respect them as much. So you're just trying to get little leans from from all of these mm. um, little bits of information. So that's kind of how I'd look at sharp versus square. And then the question is then what do you do with that information? And um, obviously you respect flows uh, based on the way that you've profiled them. Yeah, was there ever any conversations about, I guess, if, if you've profiled someone over a long amount of time, you've realised, yeah, this bloke's pretty sharp on golf. He's he's going to beat us in the long term. Was there ever any question of, you know, maybe we use this guy for information so we can a- adjust our numbers accordingly for the rest of the market? Was there any, ever anything like that, or is it just, is it always just black and white? You know, if they're going to get limited if they're just if they're too sharp. Um, you definitely use them for information. Um, some of them you would um, you would let let them bet max clip um, or the same limits as, as others would. But if they are if they are just literally skimming skimming from you day, week in week out month in month out, um, you do consider limiting certain punters. It's just something that that the bookmakers can do. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move along to Edulota then, mate. Uh, I guess give a general introduction into what. Edge Alerta does uh, for our audience because yeah, a lot of people might not have heard of them before. Yeah, sure. So Edge Alerta, I started it just under three years ago, and I saw an opportunity in the in the Australian market, especially in in the racing industry, um, whereby the bookmakers have a lot of bonus bet back promotions for second and third. So I thought surely there's some there's some big edge here, especially given the quantity of them. So. Um, I was well aware that things aren't scalable to the nth degree, having worked on the you know on the other side of the fence. But given the quantity, I thought there must be something here. So, long story short, 
worked with some devs to build a model in racing that identifies true like true value or very close to true value and just uh takes that uh, identifies that in in races with the promotions and and tips that to members and members get that those sent in real time they all come in the last few minutes just before the jump that's where the biggest opportunity is the bookies have the, the lowest margin uh pr- price and volume data has the most predictive edge in that last couple of minutes just because the liquidity is so big uh and thirdly our tipping services that we're able to sort of keep it under the radar as well a little bit when we're betting so late as opposed to betting during low low volume times so that's that's on the tipping side and that's performing at 31 percent profit on turnover we actually can't find a better performing one um around uh we've got edge actually without the promo insurance it's one of the common questions uh what about if you take the insurance of the promos out we do have about five or six percent of edge there so we're finding true value there then over time we've we've sort of that was the starting point and then over time we've we've evolved into now same game multis as well we tip those a lot of promotions out on in same game multis and from a mathematical standpoint same game multis are quite interesting um to date multis have been relatively easy to price because of their their independence so back team a over there versus team b over there and often often they're um they're independent whereas with the same game multi you've got positive and like really strong positive and negative correlations with a lot of the markets so what we've, we've built some models around identif- working out what the implied correlations the the bookies have uh, versus what we perceive or you know estimate to be the true probability true uh, correlations um, so you've got that correlation playing you've got the margin game as well so long story short we've built some saving game multi a, a tipping service around that as well and that wins at about 23 percent profit on turnover um, so yeah that's kind of the tipping side the second part of edge alerter is on the educational side of uh we'll, we'll probably go into the tipping industry in australia in a second maybe even more globally there are lots of issues with the, with the industry um we've done a lot of research into it but the second thing that we do with edge alerter is is on the educational side so i'm really trying to just bring over my insights as a professional trader uh, over to members so how do you quantify edge uh, what's the mindset that you need how do you stake mathematically optimally or close to um, and also my experience is about 365. So how do you sort of, what are the important things to know there so that you can make this a, a long-term long-term thing as well? Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, your tips or at least in the horse racing that they generated a 5 to 6% ROI just from straight from the tips, not from uh, mm-hmm. you know, getting that insurance from the bonus, which, which, yep. which is quite quite startling when you think that with the bonuses it's a 30%. ROI. So you're talking about a 25 profit on turnover. Yeah. Okay. Profit on turnover, not ROI. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like that's a, it's, it's quite a, I guess quite a big edge that you're getting just from betting into those bonus mm-hmm. markets. Like how do you think you could almost like bet blindly into these bonus markets where you, you know, you get your bonus money or you get your money back in bonus bets if, mm. If you if you come second or third in the race, or you got the the same game multi kind of promotions, like or I mean, like I'm not saying you could have an edge. Maybe you could just even be like a neutral expected value better, or maybe even just a slight mm. negative EV better. It's just looking to have a bit of fun. Can you give any kind of perspective yeah. on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, my you you could throw darts into these into these promotions, and you're betting into like 112, 116 percent books in the racing. Uh, you're probably betting into about 110% in a same game multi if you're lucky uh, with the three legs. If even if you've just found top price and got the correlation right, you could probably throw you could probably throw darts around here and there. And if you're converting your bonuses into cash at maybe 60, 70, percent, uh, you're probably about break even. That's our estimate. So you could just mm. throw darts and convert at 60 or 70, and, and you're break even. So that's better than losing at five or six percent. Um, but I mean, if you're just looking feeling... to have some fun, aren't you? Like, if, if you're just a you know standard weekend punter mm-hmm. looking to have a bit of fun, I mean, it could be, it could be just the way to go to bet into bonus markets all the time. You might as well. I mean, they've. It's just a bit of edge there for you. You've just got to play the game of sustainability as well, so that um, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it perceived as as abusing those, and that's kind of, that's part of the system that we teach as well. Looking like a looking like a square punter, but actually um taking taking plenty off the top and our members average about six or six to eight hundred aussie dollars uh, a week 
Yeah. Are there, I mean, there are obvious ways to try and disguise this, but yeah, can you maybe share a few ways that that you've gone about, yeah, trying to disguise this this activity? Because, yeah, I guess it's probably quite easy to, to mm-hmm. spot after a while if you're just getting a load of bonus bets back into your account all the time. Mm. Look, the simple things are the pretty obvious ones when you think about them, but if you're going to open up a new account, it's reasonable to assume that the, the, the counterparty on the other side, the bookmaker, is... He's going to be looking at your account a little bit more closely just to identify, just to try and sort of feel you out. Same same with a CFD broker. If you open up an account with them, there are ways to take advantage of those markets, um, but they want to kind of see a bit of a track record. Um, that's kind of starting point number number one. And then, but on an on, ongoing basis, you sort of need to mix, mix in some normal flows as well into your betting. Yeah, and I guess... The the second part is is placing those bonus bets once you get it back. What's your mm. what's your process like, and and are there like certain sports that you try and target to place your bonus bets on? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, there are there are two. So racing bonus uh, the bonus bet tips that we get the most success with are racing and golf. Uh, so on the racing side, we I guess the first thing I should say is with a bonus bet you don't keep the stake. Many of your members will know this. So. From a mathematical perspective, if you're betting into true odds, where say ten dollars when true price is ten dollars, the loss on conversion to bonus bets is the inverse of the price. So you, you're, you're bleeding ten percent on the conversion uh, if you're betting ten dollars, and twenty, it's you know you're bleeding five percent. So so you need to be looking for opportunities in that in that ten to fifteen dollar mark uh, in range if you like. So that's kind of starting point. And then where do you find uh, close to true odds? That's always the hard part. But um, in racing, we find some really good opportunities in that eight to fifteen dollar price price range. Uh, we've got some strong theories around why the opportunities are amazing there. It's primarily due to the markets being really skewed due to so many promotions, and their bookies are sort of opening themselves up in a certain part of the curve. Um, we've got the track record to actually show that we win at thirty two percent profit on turnover with if you just back out bonus bet tips with cash. Um, so that's been pretty phenomenal. That's off a sample of about 600. I think, I think golf is is really interesting. I've obviously, I mentioned at the start that I pursued a pro golf career early on. So I've got a bit of knowledge in that from a, as a player at 365, I was, uh, as I mentioned, the, the head of a, in play golf for the Asian time zone. So I've got kind of some insights from the from working on the other side of the fence there. So golf, you've got fields of, as, as many will know, 100, 140 players. So naturally you're going to get some pretty big price opportunities. Um, and we've got a golf simulator model that basically looks at um, looks to identify age, especially between rounds. We, f- we find that the markets are quite fair uh, pre-game, but then between rounds, we find some really good opportunities. Uh, again, in that ten to to twenty dollar range, often. Yeah, and and you mentioned same game multis a little bit earlier, uh, and, you, and you went into that a little bit. Can you go a bit deeper and I guess explain? Because I guess most people will look at same game multis and think. All right, we've got to get three mm. legs in there, and 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 the problem with that is where I guess we're putting three margins in there. So I guess the general perception with it, it's like accumulators, isn't it? So the more accumul- mm. uh, the more the more legs you put in, the more the more margin the bookmakers have against you. So how are you? Yeah, I guess combating against that, and I, I think you mentioned trying to bet on correlated markets. But do they, I mm. guess, take a bit of the price away when when you're betting into those correlated markets? Yeah, so just to, yeah, it's a really good question. And so with the same game multis, yeah, two parts from a, a pricing perspective. One, as you mentioned, is is the independent price and trying to beat the margin there. Uh, trying to beat three independent mm-hmm. legs with the same bookie, uh, it, it's tough. But the second part to the pricing of the same game multi is the correlation. And to be clear, we actually look at the negative correlation opportunities because the research we've done is suggesting that the broad market bets on positively correlated markets and Mm -hmm. what that means is the bookies obviously anticipate the flow their models are leaning this way and we're going the other way and and this is just something that we've picked up through our analysis and we're always looking for for sort of new new tweaks and angles Um, so that's kind of the key there uh, that that we're looking for for negative correlation plays you can't just blindly bet into them Um, you've got to look around and, and model a few things but that's where we're seeing the big opportunity right now yeah, and overall, do you see 
bookmakers increasing their promotions month on month or are you starting to see with the emergence of yeah services like yourself that they're thinking all right well <laughs> we better tone this down now mm. we've never seen more i mean we started edge alert i said about two and a half years ago and the typical saturday race day for example you'd have kind of the leading the tier one bookies doing covering eight races ten races um you mix them all together and you might have uh 12 14 races covered on a saturday these days we're averaging 30 to 35 races covered per saturday um so that's just ramped uh, i think the competition in the australian market's just such that this is just kind of a glorious period everyone's trying to acquire and retain customers so we've never seen more um same game multi promos they're only quite new they've only even that you'll notice a lot of the uh T2, T3 bookies there, they don't even have a product yet. They're trying to get a, get their head around specifically the correlation. Uh, anyone can price a an independent uh, multi when you've got correlation, it's a bit harder. So so that's quite new. Um, so yeah, we've we've never seen more. We're in lockdown in, in most of Australia at the moment and people are betting more as well. Uh, I don't know if that plays into it. Maybe the bookmakers are sort of more likely to do weekly promotions, which they are. We've actually never seen more weekday promotions. Um, so it's it's a glorious time right now. There probably will come a point where the market starts consolidating a little bit, but look, this has been going for five years, just flooding, uh, just the market flooded with all this opportunity and uh, it'll be many years before it, it tightens up to any meaningful extent. Just on your point of um, how do the bookies view sort of sharp services like ours? Like, look, where our members love what we do and many of them stick around for a very long time, but but we're a drop in the ocean in, in comparison to the market sites. You've got about you've got about four million in, in Australia, about four million active racing and sports bettors, and we've got a handful of three or four hundred members and growing, but even if we get to two thousand, I mean Two thousand divided by four million. It's kind of a drop yeah. in the ocean, especially when we're be betting at the right times as well to maintain that account sustainability, which is part part of the system. Yeah, no, well said, mate. Um, you've you've worked for Bet Three Six Five, like I've said, you've worked on yeah both both sides of the fence. Uh, you've probably been familiar with tipsters your your whole time working yeah. in the betting industry too. Um, I guess you guys are one of the good guys. What's it like? Yeah, okay. What's your overall assessment of, of 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 the tipping industry in Australia? I know you've done lots of research and and got some interesting facts for us, which I'm sure people mm. will love to hear. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I just quick preface before I go into that that research is the way I sort of try to approach the edge alerter from day one, and I thought it'd kind of be par one par for the course is approach it almost like a hedge fund and instead of your your members being perceived as just subscribers um, they're actually unit holders in your hedge fund and for them to maintain that unit not not withdraw their fund or not redeem their funds out of that fund you need to perform you need to be transparent you need to be you don't need to give away all your secrets but you need to have some transparency around your results uh, credibility is a big thing and you need to communicate to your your unit holders uh, what the processes that you know what, what opportunities you're looking for next you need to explain bad runs um, this is that's how I've approached it so when we so that's kind of how I thought that would be part of the course but as, I, as we found out and as you mentioned we did some research just a few months ago and I've just got some numbers here we've got there are about 120 tipping services in Australia and it's it's uh, you've got about 800,000 Australians following them so about 20%, I mentioned 4 million active sport and racing bettors in Australia. So about 20% of those seeking assistance um, from tipping services. It's quite a meaningful number. You've got 20% of them claiming to be Australia's best. That's so there's no, um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's a good one. Only 10% provide a track record. Again, if, 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 in the financial markets, its track record is everything and transparency is about that is everything. And for only 10% to have have one is is quite astounding. And and to add to that, many of those, uh, many of that 90% claim to have found some sort of edge, um, yet have no track record. 35% uh, are affiliates. That's um that's on a that's on a tipping service number perspective. 
but about half a million when you when you sort of knock down all the numbers you've got about 500,000 Australians are following services with either no track record or their affiliates for the bookmakers now going to affiliates now and it's a bit it's a big problem in this game so affiliates generally many of your audience would know uh, get paid for referral business just in business in general in the betting game there are two affiliate models but the most common one is a profit share of future losses so if Alex you come to uh, a dodgy alerter and and I say come on in Alex um, it's a free service just sign up to the bookie a using this link and then you're like looks it looks like a pretty good deal to me free free tips um, as soon as you sign up to that I will get 30% of trail of your future losses into perpetuity very common affiliate deal with the, with the bookies obviously there's a there's a big problem there because I'm also tipping you so there's a, there's a huge misalignment of incentives there so a lot of our members have, have been burnt by services as I said it's eight you got 800,000 Australians and growing quickly following these things and a lot of them are just um, outright scandalous so that's we're trying to bring this out and, and just educate educate people out there on, on sort of the, the traps that are the other thing I'd say just quickly is the there's a really critical assumption many tipsters make in their marketing documentation and some are, sometimes they're transparent about it but it, it gets missed by most readers it's around the assumption of top price so there are there are some high profile services out there that are extremely sent their results are extremely sensitive to the assumption of top price so whilst their track record may look good uh you can't actually achieve the top price 95 yeah. percent of the time and when you take that out you've actually got no edge a lot of the time um again back to the financial markets i often get in the past have had quant trading teams trying to get funding from me and or from the firm and it's you're looking at a track record you're trying to find, you know, go through it all and work out, is it statistically significant? Are these edges likely to persist? Um, what are the assumptions, et cetera? So lots of traps out there, long story short, lots of um, the, the bookie, it's, it's tough for a, for a better, right? You've got um, an industry where the bookmakers have a lot of power over you with, with the way they profile customers, with the way they can hang bets and, and et cetera. Lots of things, they do a lot of... Uh, They've got a lot of power there. And then then you've got this subset of those who go out and seek help. And then they're just jammed with all this um, all these traps in the in that subset of the industry as well. So it's 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 um, it's tough for the for the betters out there. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I followed many tips as myself where they'll they'll just have such a big audience where they'll tip something at one point eight, let's say, and and, and you log on a couple of hours later and the price is down to 1.5. So it's like, mm. you know, you don't get that sort of shift unless people have continued to back it at 1.7 and 1.6. Mm. So it's, it's, mm. it's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy that, yeah, I guess these things are, these are still happening. Are you, you, you kind of stunned that, that, that people will pay for a, for a tipping service when they provide absolutely no record at all like that just that just seems absolutely baffling to me i can half understand signing up to someone that's free with with affiliate links and stuff like that because people mm-hmm. just it's easy for them to have no idea about what's going on there but the the record stuff is just it's baffling mm. look it's easy to we're not you got to remember this eight hundred thousand out there for, you know following these things they're not they're not all from a quantitative field they're not all necessarily uh, really astute within investments um, it's it's easy to fall it's easy to get um, taken down the garden path I guess through just a, a Facebook ad that pops up and and suggests that they've won three of their last four four tips and it's, it's easy to get sucked into these things um, and when you see some profit numbers around when they throw them around even if they're made up it's and then it's free it's kind of like you can, you can see why a lot of a lot of people do get um taken in if you like hey do you think there's any any way we can we can change this at like a i don't know if there's like a regulation level where you can 
yeah, I guess stop these profit loss schemes, affiliate deals, all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I guess you can't really do much about people not providing a track record. I guess that's more common sense stuff. But yeah, I guess it seems slightly unethical that that someone can can make money off someone else's losses. Yeah, rig side, I, I don't know. Maybe that'll happen at some point. I think the, my view is that there just needs to be just a push of education out, the, out you know, around this. Um, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're working with some T1 media to, to sort of try and get the word out a little bit around uh, the traps. Um, as I said, people, I said just before the show that people are betting more and more in lockdown than ever. Um, you've got the bookmakers doing all these, you know, with all this power, you've got tipping services doing what they're doing. It's, um, it's, yeah, we're just, we're just working, I think on that, focusing on the educational side, I'd say, um, on that. Yeah. Interesting what you say about getting in touch with media people, because I mean, we've had the, we've had the same thing where we've tried to, yeah, I guess, educate the, the tier one media, or at least, you know, something close to that in Europe and the UK and, a lot of the time they can't really report on any of the stuff that, that we're talking about because they're also <laughs> affiliated. They're <in> on it. <laughs> so, so what's yeah. it, what's it, what's it been like for you trying to approach these, these bigger media outlets in Australia? Um, of the, the two key ones in Australia, one is well and truly in on it uh, as in they, <laughs> they're big affiliates themselves. So they're a non-starter. So we're working with the other one, if you like. Um, I mean, it, it is a bit of a shame and that um, it's hard to get the word out. But um, I will just keep chipping away. And, and yeah. And but the other thing, so affiliates are pretty. It's an it's an issue. The other thing I'd say is just on the educational side. You guys do a lot of education as well. And it's um, my view is that there's a if you watch. A lot of these, um, if you watch the races, watch sport, whenever people are talking about odds or outcomes, it's there's a lot of misinformation. There are a lot of traps out there and a lot of things that actually don't make people more astute at betting. Uh, and I'll give you a really, really easy example that, um, and I don't mean to say that disparagingly, I'm just saying this is so common. You get Joe, the tipsters, and this might be on Sky Racing, better the day. My bet of the day is horse number three. And you go, okay, what price? And they're like, no, it's my bet of the day. And you're like, and, and this, is, this is so common. It makes no sense, right? <laughs> what price are you betting it at? Is it, unless it's a sure thing, which doesn't exist, um, what price are you doing? So those sorts of things, um, it's, you got millions of people in Australia just bombarded with this sort of uh, these sorts of insights yeah. um, from the market. So, also trying to get some awareness and education around that because I mean, statistical significance doesn't come naturally to 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 most people. Um, but trying to get get more uh, astute with numbers because one thing that I find interesting is there's there are a lot of parallels, and I've drawn a few between the betting industry and the the general investment industry. Um, and I think if we can educate people to be more astute betters and understand the traps and the game theory that's involved, that's going to help them in the, in the general investment world as well. Yeah, another one you can throw in there is like a win rate and stuff like that too when, when you're talking about tips. Strike rate. Like to, yeah, strike rate. Yeah, I guess it's the yeah. same thing. Like, so, I mean, if you tell me you've got a 55% win rate, it means absolutely nothing to me. Like, mm. <laughs> even if you say yeah. you've got a 95% win rate, it absolutely means nothing at all. One of our, yeah, it's amazing. One of our members was in touch with um, one of these the big tipsters, and I won't name the name. Um, they've got over a hundred thousand followers and he was just asking them about their track record. And again, they've got over a hundred thousand followers and they, they finally responded and said, it's 72%. Like he asked, what's your track record? They said 72%. The member said, um, what's 72% is that POT? It's not going to be profit on turnover. That's too high, but is it profit on turnover? Is it ROI? If so, over what time period? Um, is it strike rate? If so, what price, what average price are you getting, et cetera? And this tipping service didn't, uh, didn't respond to that. They simply banned that user from their page. So um, that's what's going on out there. 
Yeah, no, it's a sad state of affairs, mate, and hopefully uh, we've been talking about it for years. Hopefully, uh, slowly but surely, we can uh, start to eradicate these issues. Uh, finally, mate, you're, uh, I mean, like I mentioned before, you've worked on both sides of the fence. I think I always like to finish off with, um, yeah, with a question about, I guess, general or, yeah, simple ways that people can improve their betting and, and, and you're, you're, you're someone that's been on on both sides of the fence so you've mm. you've seen yeah. it from from both sides and yeah I'm sure you'll be able to provide some valuable insight there yeah good fair question i'd i'd break it down into two parts one is quantifying an edge because that's what, at the end of the day that's that's key can you quantify an edge that, that you've got just because it won last week and the week before might not mean that there's there's any edge in it so, so work on quantifying something over a statistically significant time period. And then secondly, the stake sizing, which is absolutely critical. Um, for some reason, humans have this natural tendency to really to overstake, uh, overstake significantly. Um, and I'm talking like multiples of five or 10 of what they should be. So trying to work out what's the right um, staking plan for that strategy. Uh, so those are really the two key parts that in terms of a takeaway how do you go out and apply that i guess that's the slightly harder part but what for example we do with edge alerter is we provide a framework of of results and quantifying edge etc and we built some models around uh not only forecasting future outcomes in terms of results in golf tournaments or races but also in terms of pnl over one day over one week over one month you guys do some simulation stuff which is great too um, but that we hope uh, helps people appreciate that there are two parts to betting and, and trading, in fact, successfully. One is uh, finding true edge and secondly, staking accordingly. Yeah, no, well said, mate. And thanks so much for coming on. Maybe just let people know where they can find you and, and Edge Alerter and all the good stuff you're doing. Yeah, sure. So edgealerter.com, um, feel free to email us there or you can message us on, on social media. Um, happy to give any of your, your followers here a, a free one-week trial um, and access free access to our, our seven-day betting course, which kind of goes through the basics of our of our system to give you a bit of a feel for things. You've got the opportunity to ask questions, and, and you'll see our system applied in real time as well there. So feel free to ask for that, and uh, we'll get that set up for you. Terrific stuff, mate, and thanks everyone else for listening. Please make sure you do a quick rate and review of the podcast if you're first time listening in and subscribe to us wherever you listen to this podcast. And uh, lastly, if you are watching on YouTube, a like, subscribe, all the good stuff, it goes a long way. Thanks uh, once again, Jonas, and we'll have to catch up again one day. Thanks, Alex. 